Ships Liverpool. My name's Lindsay and I'm a member of Christchurch. We're a group of people from all sorts of different countries and backgrounds, but one in that we are joyfully captivated by the best news the world has ever heard. That God sent Jesus into the world so that by dying in our place through faith in him, we can be forgiven, restored, made right with him. That is true freedom. Freedom! We'd love to get to know you better. So please click the link below and get in touch with us. And then we can get back to you and answer any questions that you might have. Or have a look at our new website, ChristChurchLiverpool.org. There's lots going on despite COVID. Do you know that Jesus' disciples were often a little bit slow on the uptake? They were slow to learn, they were often thoughtless, even heartless, just like we can be. In fact, they even abandoned him and denied him, this man who'd been with him so long. But after the pivotal point of Christ's resurrection and ascension, they were radically transformed when the Holy Spirit was given. And they took that good news right across the region unafraid, unashamed, and the world has been changing ever since. Do you know it's changed our, our West, it's affected international laws, our dating system. So what happened in those early days? What was it like in the early days of the church? Well, we're studying in Acts of the Apostles just now. So stay on and listen and learn some of those exciting changes in the early days. And today we'll discover that this was in God's plan for a long, long, long time. So whoever you are and wherever you're listening, this great news is for you. It's the best news. Stay tuned and join us. Well, welcome to Christchurch Liverpool. It's really great to have you with us today. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm one of the interns at Christchurch Liverpool. And I must say, I'm a lot more comfortable being behind the camera uh, recording and editing than I am being in front of it. So this is, this is a good experience for me. Uh, here at Christchurch, we are really feel the importance of meeting Jesus Christ and loving his church. And what we're doing here this morning on YouTube is not the only way you can do that with us. We have in-person services going on at Christian Fellowship School, our in-person uh, gathering place. And that's, of course, all following the government guidelines. It's all very safe and you're more than welcome to come. And there's lots of other things like small groups and training courses and that really help us uh, meet Jesus Christ and love his church. And I know we keep repeating that, but it's really the, the essence of who we are as a church and what we want to preach is the gospel. Um, you can find all the details of that and lots of other stuff at our website at ChristChurchLiverpool.org. Uh, speaking of meeting Jesus Christ and loving his church again, one of the best ways uh, to do that is to get to know God by reading his word and seeing what he has to say to us. So I'll be reading now from Psalm 103. Uh, I'll be reading verses 1 to 5. So what's going to happen is I'm going to read uh, the the, all five verses now, just first. And once I've read them, um, I'll read them again and you can join in with me for part of it. So I'll be reading verse 1. You can join in with verse 2. I'll read verse 3 and then we can read verses 4 and 5 together. I'll just give you a few more seconds to find it, and then I'll start reading. Psalm 103 of David. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Okay, so I'll read that again now. So if you can join in with me for verse two and for verse four and five. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
I'll just pray for us now. Lord, we really come before you today and we really hope that this reading of your word will act as a real call to worship upon our hearts, that we can read this and we can uh, be filled with, with praise for you of really highlighting and seeing the things in our own lives that um, really just show us how great you are and that would really inspire us and take us forward into this sermon as we sing next and as we later hear from your word that we would be really full uh, in our hearts of excitement and just inspiration to, to want to know more about you and to how to follow you uh, in our world. Uh, in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, right, we'll now be singing about praising God and being inspired about 10,000 Reasons, which is a song about, about just that.
Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked his path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph. Turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle. So take on and stand the place. Well, one of the things I've certainly missed the most in lockdown is uh, singing together as a group, but uh, this, just being able to join together online and in the in-person services, even if we can't quite have the same experience, it still is a really amazing experience. And especially for what we were singing about, um, that reminder to, to praise God and to be thankful and all the things that we have to be thankful about and to praise Him for, even in these really hard times. So uh, yes, let me just pray about that after reading this verse again. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Yes, Father, just thank you so much that we can praise you and we're told to always praise you. And that's not a really hard thing because when we come to do it, we are just always amazed and overwhelmed by just the sheer amount of things that we take for granted or we just maybe don't think about that we really have to just praise you for. Just the small blessings and even the, the big blessings that we sometimes overlook. I really pray that you would help us to recognise them and to be overwhelmed with, with joy and thanksgiving for them. And as that we've just thought and sung about them now, that we would really be uplifted in our hearts and that we would be really preparing our minds to, and souls to listen to the, the teaching and to the Bible reading we've got now. In your name, Amen. Okay, it's time to grab a phone or a Bible. We're going to be doing our reading. The reference today is Acts chapter 2 verses 14 to 47. So what's happened so far in our new series in Acts is the first week we looked at how we're living in a new normal, not the new normal of living under COVID, but the new normal uh, of the church, the drastically different church that we had uh, under Jesus Christ and how that looked so different than anything we could have expected and how that came with new priorities. The priorities of reaching countries and of redeeming people and situations in crisis. And then we looked how we do all of this under new management, under the new management of God and of Jesus Christ. And this week, we're going to be looking at the very first talk or sermon given by a Christian uh, after Christ. Uh, and we'll see what happens there. So let me just give you the reference again. We're looking at Acts 2, verses 14 to 47. This week, our reading is being brought to us by Charlotte. She's a student uh, here at Christ Church. Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 47. Peter addresses the crowd. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, 
freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead and you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and will fill me with the joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah and he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The Fellowship of the Believers They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to, to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, it is really great to have you tuning in to be with us today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts today, uh, the book which is about the Acts of Jesus followers after he died and rose again. And we have that great reading from Acts chapter 2. Do keep it open or switched on on your phone. My name's Morris. I'm one of the leaders here. A um, couple of things to say, feedback I've had. First thing is, yes, I found my spare glasses and I've ordered some exciting new ones. So for regular watchers, thank you for those of you who express concern. And as well, the plant that used to be here, still not being returned, obviously can't be trusted to our care, but we will let you know about its progress and health. So I hope that's given you a chance to find your Bible, look up Acts 2, if you lost it. Uh, we uh, may well be sick of the sight of these podiums that are going to appear. Uh, it comes out, that, uh, you get the shot of the empty podiums and we are sick of hearing what they've got to say, to be honest. When you know it's Boris Johnson and Chris Whitty are about to appear, it's not usually been good news. But what the empty podium suggests, the floor is about to be given to someone. And way back when this started, I guess nearly a year ago, we were on tenterhooks as to what is going to be said. Well, we have our reading today broke into this story a little bit way th a little bit of the way through the story. Uh, chapter one and chapter two of this book have been describing the amazing days for Jesus' first followers after he'd risen from the dead and he spent time with them in his resurrected form, teaching them and training them. They must have been heady times, but suddenly Jesus was gone. And his parting words where, well, he just ignored their question about whether the kingdom of Israel would be restored, he said, wait, and the Holy Spirit will fill your lives and you will be used by the Holy Spirit to spread good news to the whole world. Now, that was not the future they had planned. 
they stood waiting for Jesus to return from the sky. Two angels arrived and said, stop standing there. Get waiting. Because the Holy Spirit is going to arrive and you've got a job to do. Well, a few days later, as Josh opened up to us last week, God himself, in the person of his spirit, did fill their lives. As the uh, history uh, of God's people had been that God appeared as a pillar of fire and they went and met him there. A few days later for these disciples, fire arrived and separated out and landed on each person. God's personal, powerful presence was given to each Christian. So they've received the spirit as Jesus has promised. Check. And when they receive the Spirit, they speak in different languages that all the people around them, people who spoke in different languages, could all understand. So they've received the Spirit, tick, and they've been become witnesses of Jesus to the nations, tick. And so it's like an empty podium. They've got the power they need to break out from hiding in their room. They've got words to say and an ability to make anyone who wants to understand what they need to say. What are they going to say as this chaos unfolds? The podium is empty. What's going to be said? And Peter, Jesus' famous disciple, steps up to the mic. Now, if you know Peter's story from the Gospels, the story of Jesus' life, It's no surprise to you that he steps up to the mic first. But Peter's last few weeks, they haven't been great. Peter, before this, the last time he had a chance to speak up for Jesus, he ignored it. He missed his chance. He didn't want to be identified with Jesus. And before this in the Bible, when we've seen Peter speak, he's generally jumped in with both feet to say something stupid and or wrong. So we should be on tenterhooks. As verse 14 says, Peter raised his voice and announced. And what is his first announcement? Well, it's this. We're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Well, that's a profound introduction to your sermon, Peter. Do you have anything better to say than that? Well, he launches into this sermon that we had read to us today. And really, while it covers quite a few verses in Acts 2, Peter has one big point to make. And that's the first thing we're going to see, Peter's point. And his point is this, normal people are receiving the Spirit because Jesus really is the Messiah. Normal people are receiving the Spirit because Jesus really is the Messiah. Peter quotes a prophecy from the book of Joel, which was written before, long before Jesus was on the scene. But that book, Joel, said, A time is coming in the future when all sorts of people will receive God's Spirit and they will prophesy. They will all become prophets. Sons, daughters, young men, old men, servants, Men and women, Joel predicted a day when all of those people would become prophets and would receive the Spirit. Now, a prophet to these people who were listening was a figure of immense importance. They were a small, select few. They were always men and they had had this personal electric encounter with God's holiness and grace and were enabled by that to speak God's very words, even to people who didn't want to hear it. But they were a special class, prophets. But Joel had said way back, a day will come when that personal, ecstatic, real relational connection to God will be available to everybody, least to the greatest, men and women. They'll all prophesy to the world. And Peter says that day, it's today, the day he's speaking. No, Mark, Peter himself is the goofball extraordinaire. Too timid just a few weeks ago to own up to knowing Jesus at all. And here he is standing up 
in a cultural centre with a cosmopolitan crowd from all over the world. This uneducated man prophetically saying to them, here's the reality and the truth about the way you've behaved and what it means. So Joel said normal people are going to receive the Spirit and become prophets, and Peter shows that it's actually happening. And Peter says in his talk, we are receiving this Spirit, this personal presence of God in our lives, because Jesus really is the Messiah. I don't know whether you've any, ever known anyone who received a, a New Year's honour or, or a Queen's birthday honour, an OBE, an MBE, a knighthood. You can't just get one of those from your neighbour. You can't say, do you fancy having an OBE? Yeah, I do too. Let's, shall we create OBEs and swap them? The only person who can award an OBE is the Queen. It's her thing. She decides if you get an OBE. It's hers to give. Well, the Spirit is God himself coming from, coming from heaven to live in people. And there is only one person who has the right to pass that personal presence of God on to us. It's the Messiah, the Saviour, God himself. And Peter's saying, because Jesus is the Messiah and he's risen and gone to be with his Father, he can give the Spirit. Now, these people who he's talking to, they've been in Jerusalem for a while. The last they saw of Jesus, he was dying on a Roman cross. And everyone has also heard, Luke the writer has told us this, that the disciples had had a very embarrassing situation unfold, a very tragic situation where one of their own number betrayed Jesus, committed suicide, <clears throat> and his boils spilled out all over the ground and everybody heard about it. They were not an impressive bunch. And to be honest, Peter talks as if at least some of the crowd he was speaking to were there in those crazy days before the Passover, calling for Jesus to be killed and a criminal to be released. But Peter is saying to them, that person you crucified you might find it hard to believe, but he is the Messiah. He is the king who can give the spirit. These people would have been dubious about that. The Messiah should be like our greatest ruler ever, King David. Here are some group of uneducated yokels claiming this crucified criminal with his pathetic followers has poured out of his spirit. No, 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 the Messiah is going to be David-like. I love it when you have a conversation with someone and they're disagreeing with you and you get to use their own words against them. I love it so you can use the phrase like, well, as you well know, because they've said something and you're repeating it back to them, it shows what they say is wrong. That's kind of what Peter does here. He says, as you well know about David, he couldn't be the Messiah. Here's the facts, he says to them. You saw Jesus' miracles. God knew you would kill him and God raised him from the dead. Death couldn't hold Jesus the Messiah. As you well know, David, who you love so much, the great king, prophesied that the Messiah would live forever. He wrote it down in the Psalms. Peter quotes him. Look, Peter says though, right here where I am standing now, over there is his tomb. So David didn't mean a king like him, because he's dead. There was someone who would come after him who wouldn't be abandoned to the tomb. And I'm here telling you, God raised Jesus from the dead and we are the witnesses. So what you see is the living Messiah pouring out God's spirit on all sorts of people so that I, an educated fisherman can tell you, rich, educated, powerful people from all over the world, that you crucified the Son of God. Boom. I guess one of the important things about this thing Peter's saying is what I would call the allness of it. We live in a world where including everybody is seen as obviously the right thing to do. We should never exclude anybody from, everything, from anything. 
that has its own problems actually. But why do we think inclusion in things is so important? It's actually because what Peter's saying here has shaped the culture we live in. The spirit of the living God with his widely inclusive bringing of anyone to be someone who can tell everyone. God's spirit has shaped the world we live in for 2,000 years. But this idea that everyone, common fishermen, women, children, could become prophets. This was revolutionary to them. I actually think, much as we've been shaped by it, it's still revolutionary to us in a way. It's fashionable in, I don't know, comfortable Western universities and medical faculties and humanity departments where people do yoga classes to be very snooty about places in the world where Christianity is exploding. It's not exploding here, but it is in other parts of the world. People in our part of the world tend to think, oh, it's because basically in those parts of the world they're a bit stupid and uneducated. But the form of Christianity that is exploding in other parts of the world is heavily shaped by the theology of this day of Pentecost, as we call it, when the Spirit was given. And that says to people in other parts of the world, while white Western people look down at you because you own nothing and you may not live long, you are lived in by the Holy Spirit, God himself. You are a prophet. You can speak the real truth to anyone, even people who look most powerful to you. This is the allness of the day of Pentecost. And of course, from around the world, those prophetic voices of Christians who don't have Netflix accounts, they do expose the truth about us. They, those Christians, know Jesus and the fullness of the power of his spirit and they condemn our soulless society and our polite but pretty dead faith. That's the allness of the day of Pentecost in practice. The message about Jesus does this to anyone who trusts him, no matter how normal, how unexpected, how not powerful. His personal presence turns you into a prophet. The allness is amazing. The other thing about I love about this sermon is, well, I love getting to enthuse about Jesus. Normal people receive the Spirit because it's Jesus who's the Messiah. I don't know whether you've ever had the experience of someone you know getting elevated to a place of importance. When people do that, they nearly always forget the people who've remained beneath them. You know, people who move away to wealthier places and they become a bit snooty about their Liverpool friends. People who are promoted above you in work and they just mix with those people up there now. We tend to think, oh, I slummed it for a while and I deserve my reward. Goodbye. The bodily man, Jesus, this should be the end of his story. He's done his job giving his life for us. He's come back to life. Now he sits, Peter said, at the right hand of God where he belongs. But Jesus is the type of Messiah who, Peter says, receives the Holy Spirit from his Father and pours that amazing gift out on his people for their sake and for the benefit of all the people in the world. There's obviously something a bit mysterious going on here. Jesus and his Father eternally love each other through the Holy Spirit. But here's the amazing thing. The exalted, powerful Jesus who sits above everyone and everything, his heart is to pour out his real presence and power and help and grace on his church, normal, weak people, to use what God has given him because he's elevated, to make sons and daughters and servants and normal people dignified prophets of the living God. It's amazing that Jesus is like that and it's because he's the Messiah like that that we get the Spirit. Peter makes one other point. The old Peter, I think, blunt and straightforward, in with both feet, raises his head because he says, before he finishes his sermon, so, postscript, 
there is one Lord of everything and you killed him. It's rather in your face, but it's repeated actually several times throughout his talk. The fact that we are told that at least some of this crowd he was talking to plotted to have the Lord of everything killed and that's making Luke the writer's point um, in this bit of Acts. It can be hard to know when we're reading Acts how much is supposed to be an example for us to follow and how much is just history that Luke's recording. And I think we always need to ask, to work that out, why is Luke telling us this fact? It's all true, but he's been selected, included some things and not others. Why include this offensive detail? I mean, Peter really wants to get it, get them in his talk, doesn't he? They have done something monumentally awful. He knew Jesus, remember, as a friend and was convinced Jesus was the focal point of history, the Lord of everything, the one they've been supposed to wait for. And I sort of feel like this is his chance to have a good rant at the people who should have welcomed Jesus and said, you had him killed instead, you crazy fools. For the first ever evangelistic sermon, the way it opens up the grand plan of God of everything, it is amazing, but it sort of ends in a strange note. Jesus is Lord of everything and you killed him. The end. I'll just leave that with you. Well, they realising that it's a pretty terrible mistake, especially as Jesus is going to have all his enemies under his feet one day, according to Peter, they actually have to say to him, well, what should we do? And he gives them this shocking news. You'd think he might say, well, you should, you know, be a bit worried, to be honest. No, Peter says, well, if you're cut to the heart, come and have your sins forgiven. They will all be wiped out. You'll move from a place where this Lord of everything is your enemy to a place where all of that is taken away. More than that, you, murderers of Jesus, will receive the Holy Spirit. The same of God's personal, powerful, loving presence in your life that we, his closest disciples, get, you will receive it too. You will be lifted from being a Christ killer to being a prophet of the living God. Sometimes this passage has been used to justify anti-Semitism as if it's like all Jews' fault that these people killed Jesus. That's to totally misread the passage. Luke's point is to say, there is nobody not worthy of, uh, who's sort of worked so bad they can't receive this gift. Even the people who killed Jesus receive the spirit. In fact, Luke's point is stronger than that. He says, the first people ahead of you and me to receive the spirit of God are the people who crucified Jesus. And I guess his point is this, if them, Definitely you. There are people who say, I could never be used by God to do anything worthwhile. I'm too bad or I'm too weak. My mental health is too poor. My language, my ability to speak is terrible. But listen, the first community of the spirit is made up of the people who actually plotted to kill Jesus. So could it be true that you're not going to be used, filled with God's Spirit? This is what Jesus, by the Spirit, does. Peter says, this promise is for all who are far off. All. And Luke proves it. Because it's these people who murdered Jesus who are there first. And they are transformed, if you read on, into a community that love each other, that are happy to be together, that love the teaching about Jesus. It's not beyond you, no matter how bad or messed up you are, to be in that type of community and to open up to the world what Jesus is like. The Holy Spirit changes the game. You might need to hold on to the fact that the first people transformed by the Spirit were the people who crucified Jesus. And that means God is filling you up for a prophetic purpose. Of course he is. That's what Jesus is like. 
he uses his exaltation to pour out gifts on his people. That's what the Spirit has been in the business of doing since the beginning. If you don't know this transforming work of the Spirit, well, it's not because you're too far away or too bad or you can't be reached by him. Could it be that for some reason, maybe even only known to you and the Lord, that you're resisting the work of God's Spirit? You don't want his work in your life. Because listen, if he can transform then, he definitely can transform you. So Peter's point is normal people receive the Spirit because Jesus really is the Messiah. Luke's point is that the people who crucified Jesus were the first to receive the Spirit. But by quoting the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, they're, make, they're both making it clear that this is all part of a story that God is telling. And here is God's point. An amazing chain is being formed. We've called this series the new normal because the same Holy Spirit poured out on that day has been present in the life of Christians since then. It wasn't an abnormal occurrence, everything started off and then the Spirit faded away. People are still filled to this day with the power to prophesy, to speak truth. And God gave that, he said in Joel, and Peter repeats, so that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, spirit given, people prophesy, other people can call on the name of the Lord. What happens immediately? Well, Peter explains that Jesus is the Lord. He is the one who rules everything. And then what happens? People call on Jesus' name, they trust in him, and they are saved. And then what happens? Well, those people who are saved are filled with the Spirit, and they empowered and helped and enabled to prophesy, to speak the truth, and they're able to tell other people that Jesus is Lord and they can be saved, and people repent to believe and they're saved. And then what happens? They receive the Spirit and empowered to prophesy, and so it goes on. That is the history of the church. We are the current end of that chain. And God is saying, listen to everyone who's trusted in him, you are the plan. It's less aggressive than that, to be honest. He's not saying you're the plan. He's, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, we, me, you and the Spirit, we are the plan for that chain to continue. There is an idea about, a wrong idea, that Christians become Christians and then some Christians receive the Spirit later on than that. It's not right, that idea. It's convenient because it allows me to explain, if that were true, why some wonderful Christians share their faith and want to serve others and love others really well, while I don't. Well, it's just I haven't received the Spirit properly. And so it's fine for me to hide at home and just spend time with Christians and play games on my phone and remain static because I never got that thing they got. But it's not right. The Spirit is here from the day of Pentecost onwards. He's in the life of every Christian. And if you will work with him, he will make you part of that amazing chain. Someone's Spirit-filled. Someone's Spirit-filled prophesied to you. They must have done if you're a Christian today. And now the call is to work with him for you to be part of that amazing chain for the world. Because now the Spirit has come, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Lord they need to call on is Jesus, and they need to hear that. And when they call on Jesus, the Spirit will come to them too. How exciting! How amazing! To be called to cooperate with God's Holy Spirit and what He is doing. The blessing you are filled up can be overflowed and passed on through showing and speaking that the Lord people can call on is Jesus. That amazing chain is happening. God's committed to it. He shows us in this passage. Our job is to look out for what he's doing and join in. It's clear this life in the spirit is yours. It's yours if you're normal or if you're bad or if you're weak. You just need to be willing. But Peter says there is a way into it. There's a gate to this spirit-filled life. Repentance 
and baptism. Repentance is a slightly old-fashioned word. We don't use it much nowadays. It means a personal turning back to God, saying to God, I will put you in charge of my life. I will stop walking away from you and ignoring you. And I will say, yes, Jesus is Lord. He is in charge. That's repentance. And then baptism is the public identification with that. So to be part of this spirit-filled community, you personally turn to God and then you make it public. So that's open to all. All the allness of it is true. But some people choose not to repent. And so Peter spends the time, says at the end of the passage, pleading with people to step out of that corrupt generation and join this new thing God is making through his spirit to become prophets to others. So if you're watching this today and you're not a Christian, I want to say the offer is here. Normal people of all types don't need to be special or holy or good or religious. Uh, repent and they become vessels of God's presence. That is open to every single person to join this amazing chain privately to turn to God and publicly to declare your faith. And this promise is for all, all who are far off. But you need to choose. Repent and be baptised. And like Peter, I plead with you to do that. Please turn to Jesus and make a public profession in him. When the Holy Spirit gets the podium, that's what he says. Normal people receive the Spirit because Jesus is the Messiah. The first people to receive the Spirit are those who crucified Jesus. You can be part of an amazing chain and the gateway to it all is repentance and baptism. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Holy Spirit, which Jesus pours out on us so liberally and kindly because he loves us and his heart is for his people. We praise you that Jesus is like that. And how we pray you would turn our hearts in repentance towards him and that you would help us publicly own him uh, in baptism. And after that, Lord, we want to be part of this amazing chain. Fill us with your spirit. Help us say words of prophecy and truth to the people around us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to continue in prayer and Josh is going to lead us. Right, let's, uh, let's continue together in prayer. Dear Father, just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together uh, online and in person uh, as Christians uh, and as non-Christians to get to know you and to have fellowship with each other. Just thank you so much for what we've, what we've seen today, how it's not some special elite or learned or great people that get to experience your spirit and get to be used by you in this world. It's just normal people going about a normal life who have your spirit sent to them and through, you, through them you work, not through great and powerful instruments, but through humble and normal people. We thank you as well that you use all people. You don't just use the good or the perfect uh, or the accomplished. You use anyone and you will use anyone powerfully, greater than they can imagine, not in a way that puffs them up or brings them glory or profit or power but in a way that even as they speak powerfully and influence people and nations, they are humbled by it as all the glory goes to you as you build up your church and your people. Let's just take a moment to reflect and think about how we can put that into practice in our own lives. Lord, as we come to you and we think about what we've learned, the answer to us is, how do we respond to this? We see 
the examples of the people that have gone before us and it's easy to see them and to think how amazing they are and how great they are. But we can't, we can't achieve what they've achieved. I just pray that you'd help us, uh, each and every one of us, if we are Christians, to really be encouraged by this, to be inspired to know that as weak or as frail or as unqualified as we feel, we can go with confidence into our workplaces, into our schools, into our universities. And we can be willing to have your spirit work through us to pass this on, to bring non-Christians to you. And we can use our gifts and your spirit to encourage and to inspire other Christians to do the same. And for any non-believers, I pray that they would see this and they would see that it doesn't matter how bad they are or how normal they are, that your message to them is still this invitation to be part of this, to repent and to believe and to be included in this family. We pray especially for the people that are trying to live this out each and every day, those that are persecuted for it and those that really suffer greatly for trying to spread your word overseas and even in this country. I pray especially for those that are partnered with our church, those that we have sent uh, as a church overseas. We pray that you'd really be with them, that you'd give them your comfort and your guidance, especially in these really difficult times of closed borders and perhaps feeling cut off from support at home. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. Now, I should have mentioned at the beginning, but I forgot. Uh, we have a live chat and it would be really great if you could let us know you're here, say hi and just enjoy that community. We're going to be using that live chat now because we're now going to spend some time praying together. And what would be really great is after we do that, we'll have about seven minutes, there'll be some like, background music praying. If you could share in the chat any encouragements, anything you really need prayer for, just anything that you want to share, you appreciate prayer for, or just would build people up. Just remember that it's uh, a public forum and don't share anything that's private or it's not yours only to share. Uh, we'll go and we'll do that now and after we finish that we'll go straight into our next song.
draw your prayers to a close. Let me just uh, finish this time of prayer. Dear Father, just thank you so much for giving us this sense of community and of sharing and of being together even when we can't be physically together. Thank you so much for the people that have shared uh, encouragements and I pray that they'd be really used to, to build uh, us up and to, to encourage not only the person that shared them but everyone who received it as well. We thank you as well for the people that have shared struggles and vulnerabilities Lord and we join with them in praying for that and we really pray that you would redeem uh, those circumstances and just thank you for their willingness to to be open and to be part of this community pray now as we sing again that we could really get close to you and this time of prayer and this song would help us reflect on who you are and draw closer to you in your name amen thank you so much for sharing in the chat again i'll repeat it's it's really something special to be, to be part of this community and to experience how we can still be together without being in person. We've got our next song, which is Jesus Strong and Kind. And the name of the song is why we're singing it, really. We sing because Jesus is strong and he is kind. And what we've been doing, as I mentioned earlier, I've been really missing corporate singing. But what we have is this amazing opportunity to sign along to the songs. And there's this really powerful image that was shared to me by a member of the Connect group, which was... By the signing, we, we, ask, we get to see an aspect of it that we perhaps wouldn't see before. So they were talking about the picture of as we reach out to Christ and then he comes back to us. And it's just that powerful image of singing quite often just feels like us, us reaching out. But it's that real image that by singing we reach out and God reaches back through that to encourage us and be with us. So we'll sing that now. It's Jesus Strong and Kind.
let me just pray for us again. Dear Father, just again, thank you for the opportunity we've had today to really join together and be encouraged by one another. We thank you so much that you are strong and you are kind. And we really pray that that knowledge combined with the message we've heard today of just normal people living a normal life, really influencing the world, not by their own strength, but by yours. I pray that your, strong, your strength and your kindness would lead us as we go away today and we go into our, our world and into our week. So that would really inspire us and help us to respond to that in a way that brings glory to you. In your name, Amen. Now perhaps you've been listening and you're not really sure what the response is for you from that. You don't really know what it means to go out into the world and look to the Spirit for strength. If you're perhaps new to Christianity and you're just tuning in uh, to try and learn more or if you're not really sure where you stand there and you want to understand more about Christianity, we are doing uh, a course called Exploring Christianity uh, here at the church. It's on this evening, uh, online, on Zoom of course. Uh, details will be put in the live chat which is on one side of me or the other and will also be below this video. It would be really uh, awesome for you to join us there. It's a very non-confrontational, non-formal environment where you can really be free to come for as long or as little as you like and to ask any or all of the questions that you want to ask. Now, this is normally where if we were in person, I would say this is the end of the formal part of the service, but stay around to eat, drink and talk to each other. Obviously, we can't quite do that in the same way, but what we can do is we have fellowship together on the live chat and we also do an after church Zoom call. Uh, this is not just for new people, though that is a really uh, great way for you to introduce yourself, for us to get to know you and to just invite you to be part of this community we're in. But also, if you're a regular, you've been here a lot. It's also just a really good place to, to enjoy spending time with people that you perhaps haven't seen for six months or more. So I encourage you all to tune into that. We also have our contact forms if you're new and again, if you have extra questions or you just want to get more involved with stuff like connect groups or training courses, uh, click the link below. It's under being able to contact us and you'll be able to submit a form with exactly what you want us to contact you about. And rest assured, we won't contact you about anything other than what you ask us to. It's been really great having you with us. Hope to see you next week.